so when we look at a face like this, we talk about the inverted triangle of youth. So when someone has a young youthful face, their volume, the peak volume should be an inverted triangle where the most of the volume projection is right across the malar mounds or the cheeks. And the apex of that triangle should be at the chin. But as they lose volume, as they age, that triangle inverts and it gives them that drawn look. It makes them look saggy. It makes them look tired. And that patient is just coming to you saying, I just don't look like myself. And you've got to identify those changes. So let's look at some studies to be better understand what it is that's happening to these patients so that we can explain to them what it is that we need to do. Now, I will put a disclaimer here. Most of the studies that we look at when it comes to aging, they are what we call cross longitudinal studies. So they look at a subgroup of patients maybe in their 20s and in their 30s and their 40s, but they don't look at patients that are the same patient aging over the course of many decades. That would be a longitudinal study and that would just take forever to do and you'd probably have trouble with patients staying in that study long-term. So we're going to extrapolate from different age groups. All right, so one of the best studies, and I put the references here, is that if you look at patients um, at a younger age, you, and you look at patients as they start to get older in comparison, we start to see some changes, especially in the early stages, right at the orbital rim in the lower eyelid region. And we're looking at changes between the bony positioning of the orbital rim and the fat pad of the malar mound in, in relation to that. So let's look at this. If you have a younger patient and you draw a line from their eye, eyeball itself straight down to the cheek, their orbital rim sits right at that intersection with the line and their malar fat pad sits a little bit anterior to that line. As the patient ages, look at the bony regression, that orbital rim moves further back and that malar fat pad also recedes. And this is one of the earliest changes we see in women before we even see it in men. This is what gives rise to what we call the negative vector face where the, again, you draw this line straight from the eyeball down to the lip, and you see that in this patient, the um, malar fat pad and the eyelids sit further back. And I apologize, I don't know why these uh, green lines and black lines are showing up on my screen. It's not, I don't think it's from anything I'm touching here. So I hope they're not too distracting for you. But you look at this patient here and they start to get what we call the tear trough deformity. So that's one change. And like I said, that's something we see very early on in women especially. But there are more changes. If we look at the bony vault of the face, and this is a, a different study now with Shaw and his group, we look at cross-sectional studies of patients and we see that the glabellar angle, this angle here over time becomes smaller. And so the forehead starts to fold in. If we look at the piriform angle here, especially when you look at men versus women, this change of the piriform angle is more pronounced in women. It starts to become smaller in this region, the nose is turning down. And then if you look at the maxillary angle, that also decreases. So basically what you're seeing is that you're seeing an involutional folding in of the face. And if we look at the front of the face of the skeleton here, we just, they're pointing here about the nasal aperture, showing you that the nasal aperture is getting bigger. I'm gonna see if I can remove my annotations here. Sorry about that. All right, we're just gonna do a mouse. All right, if you look at the nasal aperture, it gets larger as we age. And that loss of that bony support allows the nasal tip to drop. But look at this, look at the orbital aperture here and look at how much larger it is. Look at the regression of the temporal bone and the loss of that volume here. So you start to see these changes and look at how wide the mandible is over time and how less wide it is over time. So 
So if we look again, this is the maxillary angle and we're, and we're seeing that you start to get maxillary retrusion. This is another article by PESA. So let's draw that one last one. And that is the angle of the mandible over time becomes less wide and less, less wide in thickness and in height. And all of this is gonna change how the patient is going to support the soft tissue that overlies the bony vault of the face. So I'm going to go over a different study here where they looked at just kind of an age progression model and they looked at hundreds and hundreds of points on different people and tried to extrapolate from there how they potentially could age from the age of 35 up into the age of 90. And what you start to see in males is again, the same thing. You start to see that the face starts to flatten. So you look at the malar mound and you start to see a flattening of the mid face. You start to see the jowls forming as the bones start to regress at the mandible. You start to see loss of the support of the brow. So the brows start to droop and the lips become thin and elongated, especially the cutaneous lip and the nasal tip starts to drop. What's interesting when they looked at women is that they accelerated, this aging accelerated almost at twice the rate of the male people that they looked at. And it's truly fascinating. And the biggest change happened at the jawline and the lower face. So most of the bony changes in women is truly happening down here at the jawline. So this is really going to highlight for us why we need to address that particular area anatomically when we're trying to truly rejuvenate a patient. Now we can talk about different um, fat compartments and how they might grow and some will atrophy, but truly you've, it's gonna be different from one patient to another. And I'm going to take one moment here and un unshare my screen to see if I can eliminate where these lines came from. And I'll come right back on in a moment here. So I apologize. All right, let me open that presentation back up. Dr. Susan, one question from Dr. Yes. Marwa. Please tell us about the scoring system of assessing aging, which is the best one. I'm sorry, tell me again the question. Please tell us about the scoring system of assessing the aging and which is the best one. Okay, uh, so the, the best way to... Dr. Sakia, let us wait till the end of the presentation. Let us wait okay. till the end of the presentation so we don't interrupt her, Suzanne. Let her finish her thing. Okay. 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 All right. So we got rid of these lines. Now let's see how we can approach our patient. Now, looking at this, now we know the anatomic changes that are happening and we know the volume Dr. loss. Dr. Sakia. Yes. Hello. Let us wait till the end of the presentation. Let us wait till the end of the presentation so we don't interrupt her, Suzanne. Let us finish her thing. Okay, okay, got it, got it. Yeah. Okay. Can, you, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. All right. So let's look at a patient and let's walk through. This is one of my patients here. So when I assess her, I'm looking at the panfacial volume. And I truly don't go with a set system of assessing facial volume loss because it's gonna be different patient to patient, gender to gender, ethnicity to ethnicity and racial makeup. So truly it's gonna be an individualized approach to each patient. I look at the periorbital region. I look at the mid face and I look at the jawline. Like I said, the jawline is truly one of the most atrophic areas where we're seeing the changes the fastest in women. And that's the, one of the biggest reasons women always will come in and say, I hate my neck. It's not so much that they really hate their neck. They don't understand that they've lost support to that whole lower face. And let's take this patient now and pull up the images of what we were seeing before. And you can see the temporal volume loss. You can see the fat loss at the brow. You can see the orbital rim is more pronounced. You can see she's getting a little bit of lack of support here at the jawline, but this is her anterior view. We're looking at just basically what's happening here around the eyes with the widening of the orbital aperture. 
Her mid face, that maxillary retrusion right here, is causing this deepening of the nasolabial fold. And that loss of the support at the orbital rim is causing descent of that malar fat pad. And then her jawline. And women hate their necks, but it's not the neck issue, it's a jawline issue. Look at the loss of the bony support as we age. Look at her neck, her jawline here. You can see the loss of the bone. This jowl, this jowl fat pad, that doesn't really grow much. It might grow a little bit, but it really doesn't grow much. Truly what's happening is that the bone is receding in front of it and behind it and unmasking that jowl. So we've got to think about how we can fill these areas. So we used to think we can do surgery and fix just about everything. And we realized that with just overly aggressive surgery, using just surgery by itself to try to correct things by lifting them without addressing volume, we created a lot of problems for our patients. These are both patients that had upper and lower eyelid blepharoplasties and a facelift. And this patient in the top picture here also had cheek implants put in. I would not look at these patients and say they look rejuvenated. This one only had her surgery at the top here four years ago. So she had upper lower eye lift, cheek implants, a facelift, and she still looks very tired. And look at the mouth positioning of her lateral canthus. Look at the long lid cheek junction. So that's a lot of volume loss. And there's her cheek implant, you can see it. This patient again, she's got scleral show. She's got uh, lateral canthal laxity. She's got still a long uh, lid cheek junction. And this poor patient, this is the, I see her here on the left when she comes to see me for a consultation. She had upper and lower eye lifts. She had a brow lift. She doesn't look anything like she used to look when she was in her twenties. So we have not rejuvenated her. Rejuvenation means taking someone and making them look as good as they used to look. And we've changed her completely. So this is not the approach we want. And then people thought, well, we can fill. So that's gonna be the answer. Let's fill everybody. Let's stop doing the surgeries and let's start filling. And then we start to see what happened. And so we start to see famous people start to look very, very, very distorted. Even this actress, you would say she's gorgeous. Even when she was young and much older, she's beautiful. But I will tell you that she's a little over volumized here and her lips especially are over volumized. So she does look beautiful, but it's not quite who she used to look like. And that's what our patients are saying. Our patients are telling us, I want to look good. I don't want to look different. So what we're going to do now, we're going to shift our focus here to choosing different fillers so we can revolumize the face. And we're gonna choose them based on their physio physiologic or rheologic properties. We're also going to look at them based on the, the anatomy and where we wanna place them in the, in the face. Are we placing them deep on the bone? Are we placing them in the subcutaneous? Are we placing them subdermally? So these are the approaches we're gonna look at. And then I'm gonna switch gears and talk about fat transfer because you can't talk about volume replacement in strictly in the terms of fillers. You've got to also talk about using fat. So we're going to talk about the refill stage that we discuss with our patient. This is one of the book chapters I wrote with one of my previous fellows. And we talked about an anatomic algorithm to fillers. So this is what I, the steps I take when I'm looking at a patient. And again, everywhere I would normally try to fill with fat, I would try to fill with filler as well, if I can, to try to create a harmonious look. But it's picking the right filler for the right anatomic location, picking the correct skin thickness and filler for the skin thickness of the area that you're treating. So you don't want to put a filler that can become nodular in the area with thin skin, you'll see bumps everywhere. You don't wanna put a very thin and lightweight filler in the area with thick skin because it's not gonna do much. So you're gonna look at skin thickness, you're gonna look at previous surgery in the area that you're working on because especially around the eyes, if they've had a lot of lower eyelid surgery, a canthopexy, a mid facelift that went, that was a transcutaneous one from the um, lower eyelid region, these patients are gonna have impaired lymphatics even years later, and they're gonna be predisposed to prolonged edema. 
we want to make sure they don't have any contraindication to in injections such as active infections. And then again, we're going to pick fillers based on their longevity and what's going to work best in the area we want to treat. I would be remiss if I don't mention that no matter what you're doing, if you're using fillers, you should always be prepared to deal with a catastrophe such as a in arterial embolization or an arterial compression. So I always have on hand in my emergency case, aspirin, nitroglycerin paste. Uh, we can give antibiotics as well if we start to get concerned about skin breakdown. If we really have a huge problem, we can refer them for hyperbaric oxygen. But with most hyaluronic acids, if you have vitrase or hyaluronidase on hand, you're gonna use that to dissolve that filler as quickly as possible and keep flushing the area with that to try to get some of that filler dissolved that's causing the occlusion or the compression. But I, this whole topic is a whole different lecture. So I just wanna just make sure though, everyone doing fillers with hyaluronic acids should have these on hand. Now let's look at this patient, for example, and we're going to pick and choose how to address her volume loss. And we're going to pick fillers that either can lift, fillers that have the ability to spread, Lifting ability, spreading ability, longevity. fillers that um, right. have a good longevity, and fillers based on how much water they can pull in or hide their hydration capability. All right. Most of our fillers are hyaluronic acids. Now, in my country, these are the fillers by the name we have them. Every country is gonna have, even from the same manufacturer, a slightly different name for the fillers. So just be familiar with yours. But most days now, these are made in the laboratory from streptococcus fermentation. And they, these are all hyaluronic acid fillers. Other fillers that we might use that are not within the hyaluronic acid family are biostimulatory fillers, such as poly -L lactic acid, known as Sculptra here in the US calcium hydroxyl appetite. And then ones that are less commonly used here in the US, such as a polymethyl methacrylate beads, silicone, but one that I love the most and we will talk about in more detail is autologous fat. But the biostimulatory fillers, sculpture, radius, art fill or bella fill and silicone. What these do is that you put these into the skin and they give a little bit of fill or lift themselves, but really it's the collagen production that they induce that allows them to become a space occupying filler. Whereas with these, what you inject is what you're going to get for the most part. Any change after that is more from their ability to draw in water and moisture and less so from uh, stimulating collagen production. So these are called biostimulatory fillers here. All right, so one thing I like about hyaluronic acid fillers is that they each, from each different manufacturer or within the same manufacturer, they design them to have very different rheologic properties. And we'll talk about uh, what these are. The first one is hydration. It's really interesting to see that they're in, while usually glycosaminoglycans are produced in the skin and we consider them to be almost the sponges in the skin, they draw in water naturally when we, our body makes them. Well, so do these fillers, but to different degrees. So for example, one that's called Prevel Silk, after you inject it, it attracts 25% water weight to it. Restylane and, and Restylane Lift used to be called Perlane, draws in about 50% of its weight in water. But Juvederm Ultra Plus, for example, draws in 300% its weight in water, which is why we had a huge problem when we used to inject Juvederm undiluted under the eyelids to improve the tear troughs. And all of a sudden, all these patients, six months later, one year later, developed tremendous edema around the eyes. So you've got to pick now, and if you're going to fill, for example, the lips, you might want that. You might want to be able to put in a filler that is then going to hydrate and give even more filling, but you might not want that. So a patient that wants a very subtle result wants to be able to see when they leave the office what that's going to look like. And you might want to use something such as in the Restylane family around the eyes because you know what you see is what you're going to get, and there's not going to be a lot of volume 
uh, or water attracted to the area after the patient leaves your office. G prime is another very important property. Each tissue is trying to work now against the weight of the skin that you're putting it into. So the ability to lift is considered the G prime. Uh, so when a patient, when a filler has a higher G prime, where you put it, it's more resistant to the deformation from the weight of the skin. So when you put it in a, along the cheekbones, it's going to give you more lifting in the cheekbones. Other fillers may have a low G prime. They're going to be more compressed with the weight of the skin. So they're going to give a little bit more spread. And so if you need lift in the area, you're going to try to choose a filler that has a high G prime. If you're trying to get a little more spread and not quite so much seeing the bump, or seeing where you're actually placing the filler, you might want something with a lower G prime. This is an example of one of the uh, graphs that the companies put out showing you the G prime uh, or the elastic modulus, the G prime of different fillers compared to uh, from the Restylane family compared to the Juvederm or Allergan family here and one from MERS called Bellotero. So again, you're going to choose how you're going to put them in the skin based on lift versus spread. So again, and now we're going to add radius into this graph. And you'll see that radius of all the fillers or calcium hydroxyl appetite of all the fillers has the highest G prime. So again, you don't want to put something like this in the lips. It can become nodular and become stiff you want to put something in the lips that's a little softer, a little more spreadable, so that it moves with the motion of the lips, or so that when you put it near the eyes, you don't see the nodularity. We can look at the cohesiveness of these gels or hyaluronic acids. So this is, for example, Bellotero Balance from MERS. And you can see when you put, and this is Restylane here, when you put uh, the hyaluronic acid between these two metal plates and you pull the metal plates apart, the Bellotero is a more cohesive gel and it tends to stay attached for much, much longer. So it's going to be a little bit more malleable within the tissue. Uh, with now Juvederm has launched, I'm sorry, Restylane has launched Restylane Refine and Define in the US and they have a different name overseas, those are more of their cohesive gels. So become familiar with the hyaluronic acids that you have in your country, become familiar with their properties, and then start to decide where you want to put these in the face to give the optimal result. And if we look at them in the skin, your cohesive gels tend to occupy in the blue here, a lot more even spread in the skin. And when you look at things that are high G prime, more particulate, less cohesive, you start to see that they're just more particulate in the skin. And this is Restylane in here. This is just an example, and this could be any filler here that's in the biostimulatory uh, category. So it could be calcium hydroxyl appetite, polyelectric acid. It can be the polymethyl methacrylate beads. But these are showing that when you first inject the particles, you start to see over the course of weeks more pink surrounding them. That's new collagen coming in and forming around these particles. And that's what makes them biostimulatory. So once you choose the filler you want, you have to decide where you're going to put it. You can put the filler in so many different levels, but that might not be the best use of your filler. So you have to look at where you're going to place it to achieve the anatomic desired look. So I talk about filling in two different planes for the most part, subdermally here in the sub Q and just under the skin or super periosteally right above bone. And so when you fill above bone, you're giving lift. It's almost like you're anchoring the soft tissue to that filler. When you inject subdermally or subcutaneously, you're giving volume. So depending on where you need lift, you must go at a deeper level. So these are the areas I will inject at the supra periosteal level. Temples, jawline, zygoma, and right along the tear trough or the infraorbital rim. Where I like to inject subdermally or subcutaneously, 
depending on the patient, is in the perioral region, the brows, and the malar cheeks. Periorally, I'm really superficial because I'm just trying to efface those wrinkles that are around the mouth. But in the brows, I'm trying to recreate a brow fat pad. In the malar cheeks, I'm trying to recreate a malar mound. So these are going to be a sub Q and they're going to be um, a little bit more of a volumetric change for the patient. I, I'll get my setup ready. I've got my ice, ice packs that I can activate and cool the patient. I've got all my different fillers if I need it. I cleanse the skin with a lot of 70% alcohol. So I use it in a pump. So I'm not using the small pledgeette and I have a big stack of gauze. And I'll probably go through this every single day in just one room. So I'll use a lot of gauze, lots of alcohol and really scrub the skin. I feel that doing this, my infection rate is almost zero. I don't like to put chlorhexidine on the skin. I don't like to put anything near the eyes that can be toxic to the eyes. And I don't like the mess of things like betadine. So I really do like to use uh, the alcohol gauze 70% and scrub the skin. And I have everything ready because I will use different needles depending on where I'm injecting and what filler I'm injecting. With the goal being, I want to use the smallest needle I can to minimize trauma, but not so small that I'm having trouble injecting. But I might switch out what they give me from the company and not really follow what they're giving me to use. So, and I might mix into some of the fillers, my own lidocaine into the solution to prehydrate them. And I find that this is especially helpful with fillers like Juvederm that are going to pull in 300% of their weight in water. I don't want that to happen after the patient leaves the office. I actually want to prehydrate that filler so that as I'm injecting, I can see roughly what the volume is that they're going to get. Now, we're going to start injecting, uh, in, for example, for deep, deep lift. We want to inject right along the bone. And usually if you go a centimeter out from the uh, orbital rim, so the orbital rim comes here, about a centimeter out and just close to the, uh, the orbital rim of where the brow hairs meet as well, that tends to be a safe zone. I do aspirate in this area though to make sure that I'm not in the vessel. And I will inject my filler right onto the periosteum. Now this area takes a lot of filler. So again, you're going to pick and choose what filler you choose for your patient based on how much money they can spend, um, how many times they're going to need to have that treatment done and how hollow they are. But similarly, if I can feel bone on the jawline, I'll come down and I'll inject along bone. Now, if I'm not able, if the patient has too much bony resorption, then I will inject in the subcutaneous plane and try to recreate what should be a jawline. And then periosteum right on the zygoma. So I'm turned a little bit here just so you can see the angle, but really I'm coming in straight onto the zygoma here and injecting boluses to really tent up the skin and lift. And similarly at the pre-jowl sulcus. Remember, we need to fill behind the jowl that is forming here, the fat pad. We need to inject back here where they've got the bony resorption and in front at the pre-jowl sulcus where they also have bony absorption. And these are super periosteal. Now fanning technique is going to be much, much more superficial in areas where you need to get the lines that are etched into the dermis to smooth out. And in the brows to create a nice brow fat pad appearance. So you're going to be here much more subcutaneous, whereas here you're going to be literally just under the skin. And then here is the patient after she's had full face rejuvenation and the patient looks like she's better. She's still going to go um, home and there'll be a little bit of remodeling. And, but the goal is that you've done enough that you can really predict the end result before you let her leave the office. But look at the brow fat pad. So here her brow is dropping off the edge. Here we've created 
a nice area of fullness so that it reflects the light and really gives that more youthful brow look and it pulls up the extra skin around the eyes. Similar, similarly, at the orbital rim, the temples. And remember, your temples support the cheeks. So when you're filling deep and lifting the temples up, you're supporting the, the fat pad that comes down onto the zygoma as well. So it's a nice way to tent the mid face. And then periorally, she doesn't look overly plump, but if you look more closely and see her lines are much better. But look at this dip in her pre-jowl sulcus on the left and that she's got a much smoother contour here. So that's just immediate after, at the time of treatment. This is another immediate before and after photo showing building up at the periosteal level at the chin in the pre-jowl sulcus and then really trying to support the loss of volume from bone and fat that happens and causes this deep marionette line. Hello? Uh, can you guys still hear me? Because I'm hearing, a, I hear some voices on the, okay. All right, okay. if someone can just tell me you can still hear me, that would be great. Uh, so this is the perioral region showing that we're improving all of these lines superficially and into the edge of the lip because you've got to give those lines a, a chance to be effaced right at that lip border without now, making the lip necessarily bigger. Uh, Hi, Dr. Thomas, can you guys hear yeah, me? Yeah, we can, we can hear you very clearly. I, okay. I want everybody to unmute, unmute themselves and don't speak. To mute themselves. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. So, and then we can see that you've got to support all of the lower lip edge as well as the, so on the mucosal side, as well as the cutaneous side to really give this beautiful result here. And these are all immediate post-op photos. And then the lower eyelid, same thing. We can really treat at the periosteum and soften the tear trough without overcorrecting and without putting in a filler that's going to overly hydrate. So I'm just gonna go a little faster here and show you the, the goal is to build a patient up like this and start to soften that bone loss and support that lower face and improve this maxillary retrusion here, but come back and add more for her. She's gonna need more. This is one, one vial of polyolactic acid in her left buccal and malar region because she had uh, an airbag hit her in the face and she had trauma. So she lost volume on one side of her face. Here she is five months later showing the nice improvement. If you tilt her face down, you see the lack of support. And when you volumize the cheek, you see that it doesn't droop as much when they tilt down. But why fat in the age of fillers? And I will still tell you, I do a lot of fat transfers. I did another patient this week. I did two last week. I think fat is probably the, the most ideal filler that you can come across. It's living, it's non-allergenic, it's loaded with stem cells. It has all the amazing properties of a filler if it's done properly. And why do I say that? Um, let, me, uh, let me go back also economically it's a huge expense saver for patients. And the reason I say this, just when patients see this in the brochures, they'll see these companies give out a brochure and say, this is a patient before and after, look at the nice improvement from the left to the right. And then in the fine print somewhere deep in the brochure, it'll say a patient had two syringes or three syringes or six syringes of filler. And these are temporary fillers. So over time they become very expensive. And I know for a fact that with fat, it gives me so much more volume to work with and it's longer lasting for me in most anatomic areas that it becomes a cost savings for the patient. So how do I talk to patients about it? Well, if a patient's nervous about doing something long lasting like a fat transfer, we'll start with a filler first and introduce them to it. Uh, a patient comes in with uh, needing uh, one, wants one area done and you look at them, they need the whole face done, that's different. You need to kind of redirect that conversation. That patient might need much, much more volume than what their one concern is if they really want to look rejuvenated. Patients really don't know what they need sometimes. But I will use fillers as a stepping stone. 
And then I will use my fat transfer also in conjunction with other surgeries, whether it's with a facelift and eye lift to help restore volume and to enhance all my results. So a uh, fat transfer for most surgeons who've done it, if you are here on the call with me and you've done it, you know what I'm talking about. It's either very rewarding or it's very frustrating. And a lot of it has to do with, I think some of the ways that we inject the fat and the patients that we select. And that, there's a whole other lecture we can get into on patient selection and proper technique, but I try never to overpromise the results for my patients. I give them realistic expectations. And I do tell them, you do need to continue to add a little more fat the first year until we get the desired improvement, but that the aging process continues so that we need to constantly come back and address them and add maybe synthetic fillers as they continue to age. So I will tell them that we use fat to build the foundation, a nice scaffold, and then we use fillers to touch things up. And I don't know why we're seeing lines showing up on the screen again. I truly apologize. I've never had this happen. And we can address areas that fillers aren't usually the best option. So this is my typical setup. This is my operating room. I will have, if I'm doing body liposuction, you'll see the body lipo tubing and the cannulas. But for the most part, for the fat transfer, this is all I need right here. I'm going to stop sharing the screen. I'm gonna close the presentation one more time and pull it back up. I apologize. Here. Perfect. I'm going to share my screen from here. There we go. So with the fat transfer, you don't need a whole lot of setup and that's the beauty of it. So once you invest in your small in array of instruments, that's it, it doesn't cost you much to do the procedure. So typically I'll just have a 15 blade to make an incision, a three millimeter harvesting cannula, and I'll use a 10 ml syringe to pull my fat into this. If I'm doing small areas, this is not for, um, breasts and buttocks where you're using hundreds of mLs. This is truly just for the face where we just need to aspirate 80 to 100 mLs of fat. And I like to make sure I'm not traumatizing the fat. So I'm only pulling back two, two milliliters of manual suction in this 10 mL syringe. And I do have albumin in here to restore some of the oncotic pressure for the fat since there's so much tumescent anesthesia in here. It's just to draw some of that fluid off. And I just manually aspirate the fat. And you can either let it decant or you can centrifuge it. I just centrifuge truly for 30 seconds at 3000 RPMs, but you can let it sit and let it self decant as well. And what you'll find is that the fat separates into the non-viable oil layer, which you wanna throw away. And the infranatant, which is mostly anesthetic fluid, which you can discard as well. And the viable fat and the viable stem cells are all in this middle fat layer here. And then we transfer them into one ML syringes. And then I like to inject, my favorite cannulas are the Coleman cannulas because that's the technique we all learned from in the beginning. And my go-to for most of my patients is the Coleman number two cannula, which is not super blunt like the number one and not least blunt like the number three. So it's a less, it's going to be, allow me to get through most tissue, most fibrotic areas, but without uh, causing a lot of damage to the tissue. And then I'll mark the patient. So I will mark this patient had aggressive upper and lower eyelid surgery and they've hollowed her out. I've got to restore the brow shape under the eyes, the temples, the cheeks, the buccal region, the melomental fold. And I try then to minimize the number of incisions that we make, because that way patients, we can reach most areas from just two or three tiny incisions. I use a no-core needle to make a little stab incision. And from this zygomatic arch incision, I can reach the lower eyelid, I can reach up into the brow, I can do the temples, and I can reach down to the chin. 
Now, this is a nine centimeter length of on the Coleman number two cannula. From here, I'm showing I can reach all of these different regions. And now if I do start to place the fat, the most important thing around the eyes is not to put fat in a superficial layer. You will regret it. It will look great in the beginning and then you're gonna be left with nodules. You've got to be under the orbicularis, right on periosteum in this region. And when you come back and you're pulling out as you're injecting the fat, I always place it in a zigzag pattern so that I'm not leaving strands of fat. That will be very palpable later on. And the patients will have those tiny pieces of fat that look like worms or spaghetti noodles under their skin. And I'm reaching from the same incision point down to efface the nasolabial fold. This is superficially, like you're doing a subcision to release the tethering here. And then you're placing tiny aliquots of fat just in front and just under that nasolabial fold. Not too much, you can use fillers in the future to add more, but you're basically subsizing and then putting a little fat so that skin doesn't become adherent again to the muscle. And I'm using again, my left hand, because I'm right-handed, my left hand is my smart hand. It's telling me where I am, it's helping me position the tissue to the cannula. And I can come in and I can add in in the pre-parotid region and really help support the buccal area and the pre-parotid area and address these areas a little bit more deeply. And then again, you use your smart hand to help guide the tissue to the cannula and to help you get into multiple different layers. And then I approach the jawline possibly from two different angles, from this in incision point and then again from the preauricular region as well. I don't fill in the, the jowls so I make sure I draw them out so that we're not adding volume there, but I'm working in front of them and behind them. And then similarly in the brow, I'm going to, or in the temples, I'm going to come in and I'm going to add fat in the temples and in the brows from the same position, or I may come from the super brow location as well, just depending on the patient, depending on the shape of their bony anatomy, and if I can angle around there with my cannula. Don't forget to augment the mid chin. That's hard to reach from either side. So you're going to come just from the sub mental, re sub -mental region here. And the goal at the end of surgery, this is the augmented side here on the left. This is the unaugmented side on the right. So we can see the volume that we're trying to achieve. And, and in all of this, I'm putting tiny, tiny aliquots of fat so it's going to take me a while to empty that one ml syringe. I'm not putting it all in one spot. If you do that, you're going to guarantee that all the fat dies. And then this is when both sides are augmented and she looks extremely symmetrical. The side here now on the right is augmented, the side on the left is not. And this is what patients typically can look like when they finish the procedure. In her, we did not do the brows, but we did all of her mid face and temples to try to support her and under her eyes first. And then we came back in the future and added more to her brows, but this, they should not look too beat up. My patients are all done under local anesthetic, so they're all awake for the procedure. So again, before, and this is in the center here immediately at the time of finishing the surgery, and this is at one week. So there should be very little bruising, very little swelling at one week. So let's just take a couple minutes and look at some pictures and then we can, uh, move on to questions. This is that patient we saw in the beginning, upper and lower eye lift already, facelift, cheek implants, all before I met her. Nobody would look at this patient and think that she looks rejuvenated. So we did several things. We did do a chemical peel to tighten the eyelids. We did send her to have a lateral canthopexy done to resuspend the lateral canthus. And then we added fat three different sessions and you can see the nice improvement. Now she says she looks like the granddaughter of the patient in this picture here. But that's several years out. This is three fat transfer sessions, a chemical peel and lower eyelid repositioning. But look at the volume of loose skin and then watch how with correct volume augmentation, you can pull that up. So it does make a big difference over time. This patient also was overly uh, uh, resected under the lower eyelids with her fat somewhere else before I met her. And here she is a year and a half later, having that volume put back in under the eyes and in the brow. 
Look at the brow here, a year and a half later looks much younger than the brow positioning before her procedure. You can really lift some of the extra skin on the upper eyelids in a youthful patient at an early stage by just revolumizing the brow. This is two years out from the lower eyelid and mid face. So fat does do well, this is two years later. Here she is eight years later. On this day, she's coming back for more. But even eight years later, look under the eyes. She still looks a million times better than she did eight years prior. But look at the aging process has continued. It's, she's lost so much more volume in her temples. So here she is again, two years out under the eyes and in the cheeks. And here she is eight years later on the left. And now she's got a lot of that lower face volume loss in the chin and in the jawbone and in the temples up here. So this is her a week after we put fat in the chin and along the jawline just to help recreate a nicer lower face. And that's what you've got to do. You've got to kind of just shift your focus when patients lose volume in different areas. So you might address one area and they continue to age around it. And I do think every area you've put fat tends to age slower. This is a patient, this is funny. She didn't think she saw improvement after her fat transfer. I don't know about you guys, but she has tremendous improvement. And I had to pull the pictures to show her. In fact, I had to double and triple check that this was actually the same patient because I think she looks so much better. But she initially didn't think she saw improvement. When we showed her her before and after side by side, look at the temples even, look at the brow fat. Look at the mid face, the buccal region, the chin, all of that is beautifully improved. Now it doesn't replace the need at some point in the future, maybe to do a lower facelift, but these patients are extremely happy. Peri-Romberg syndrome, semi-facial, uh, hemifacial atrophy. And this patient would have had to undergo extensive muscle flaps and grafting to address the bone and fat loss that has happened. So here she is after several sessions. This is a few years out. Beautiful symmetry. What I cannot do is really fix the enophthalmus that has occurred from the loss of bone and fat around the actual eyeball itself on this side. So she still has enophthalmus, but I've re-volumized and re-balanced uh, her face. Here she is from the side. And you can see how we've recreated a beautiful mandible. This is again, a year later, just a subtle, subtle improvement on the face. And sorry, my picture switch here. This is actually the before picture and this is her after. This is one year. Here we go. This is the correct order here. This is the before and this is the after. So I apologize on the previous one. And then this is a facelift, but adding volume into the cheek and at the jawline as well. So you can improve things by tightening with a lift, but you still have to revolumize the tear trough, the mid face, and then the jawline where they've lost bone. Thank you very much for your attention on this. And Dr. Thomas. Yeah, extraordinary result. Thank you, Dr. Sazan. Yeah. So, a couple pleasure. of questions, Dr. Thomas. One minute. One minute. Susan, what a, Susan, what a, what a fabulous, fabulous, all the guys watching, what a fabulous presentation. Awesome. Now, there are some questions that have been posed from the from the audience here. Um, Thank you. And the, the questions are, this, these, I will ask the questions. The scoring system, uh, they want to know the scoring system you use for assessing aging and which, in your opinion, is the best one? So that's a good question. Honestly, I don't use a scoring system in myself to assess aging because I actually do what I showed before, which is I'm looking at each patient from the standpoint of do they need volume? Do they need you know, the, the R's, the four R's of rejuvenation? And I look at that more comprehensively, 
rather than an actual scoring system. Because also, like I said, I see a wide diversity of patients. I see Indian patients, African American patients, Asian patients, Caucasian patients. So I think each racial group is also going to age differently. Some people age more with skin changes and volumetric changes. Some people age more with volume growth. So I, I try to just kind of assess each patient based on the four R's and kind of formulate a plan for them with that. So, like I said, I see a wide diversity of patients. I see Indian patients, African American patients, Asian patients, Caucasian patients. So I think each racial group is also going to age differently. Some people age more with skin changes and volumetric changes. Some people age more with volume growth. So I, I try to just kind of assess each patient based on the four R's and kind of formulate a plan for them with that. Now the next question is, what kind of needle is uh, safe for temporal filling? Uh, so that's a really good question. I rarely use cannulas. I do use cannulas from time to time, mostly in if I'm working along the jowl area, uh, the pre-jowl area, because that tends to bruise the most. And when I'm working in the pre-jowl area and using a cannula, I'm still not assuming it's 100% safe because there have been cases of being able to penetrate a vessel with a uh, cannula and still get an embolus. But what I do with the temple, I in the temple, I'm very nervous about injecting anything that I cannot on a, on a syringe aspirate and make sure I'm not in a vessel. So I tend to use poly L lactic acid to inject the temples deep so, because that's very watery. And when I pull back on the syringe, I can see if there's a flash. And in the 15 years I've done it, I had one flashback, which meant I was in, in a vessel, and that happened just a few months ago. But if I use a hyaluronic acid filler and try to aspirate, it may not be truly accurate. You might aspirate and see nothing, and you might be in a vessel because it's, the gel is so thick. So I don't think it's so much the needle versus the cannula of, as to whether it's safe. I think it's the filler in the temple. And so I tend to use one that's more liquidy that I can actually aspirate and see if I'm in a vessel. Which meant I was in a vessel and that happened just a few months ago. But if I use a hyaluronic acid filler and try to aspirate, it may not be truly accurate. You might aspirate and see nothing and you might be in a vessel because the gel is so thick. So I don't think it's so much the needle versus the cannula as to whether it's safe. I think it's the filler in the temple. And so I tend to use one that's more liquidy that I can actually aspirate and see if I'm in a vessel. Dr. Sakya is the, is the incoming president for the coming year of the Dermatological Society. Very well respected. I'll let Dr. Sakya, there are two more questions that I want Dr. Sakya to ask, after which I have one question to conclude with. Yeah, and I have also one question. So, uh, Dr. Sir, one question, which kind of fillers we are permitted to inject around the eyes? So, so question it, from uh, the incoming president for the coming year. Yes, so the fillers that I like to use around the eyes are in the hyaluronic acid family. I don't like to use calcium hydroxyl apatite or poly -L lactic acid or polymethyl methacrylate because around the eyes, over time, as they build collagen with these biostimulatory fillers, they can become nodular. And then you're forced to go back in and have to do surgery to remove them. So I like hyaluronic acids around the eyes. Typically, I like one that has a high G prime so that it's lifting and not one that's going to pull in a lot of moisture. Calcium hydroxyl appetite or poly -L lactic acid or polymethyl methacrylate because around the eyes, over time, as they build collagen with these biostimulatory fillers, they can become nodular. And then you're forced to go back in and have to do surgery to remove them. So I like hyaluronic acids around the eyes. Typically, I like one that has a high G prime so that it's lifting and not one that's going to pull in a lot of moisture. Hydroxyapatite or polyelectric acid or polymethylmethacrylate because around the eyes, over time, as they build collagen with these biostimulatory fillers, they can become nodular. 
and then you're forced to go back in and have to do surgery to remove them. So I like yeah. hyaluronic acid around the eye. Typically, I like one that has a high G prime because I do this thing and not one that's going to pull in a lot of moisture. Yeah. So one more question from Dr. Praveen, he's, uh, he's an experienced guy. So his question is the uh, fan technique in, in above the upper lips for smokers line can cause shift of the filler in the upper lips. So he's saying in two patients, what is the reason for shifting the shifting of the filler in the upper lip? Yes, and that's a great question also. And what's happening is the filler when the, basically, the question, question is. Uh, sorry, I'm hearing the questions twice. I apologize. So the filler around the lip is very challenging because you've got to make sure that you're filling the area with a filler that's going to lift the skin and not draw in too much moisture. If it draws in moisture, then what happens is it becomes heavy and it pushes the lip down. And that's going to defeat the purpose for the most part. You need to be able to put a filler that's going to go under the skin and smooth the skin out, but there's a high deep prime, but not one that's going to draw in a lot of water. When it draws water, it's going to, again, like I said, become heavy and push the lip down. And that's not a good look for anyone. Yeah, look. Uh, Susan, I have a question. So, it, so many techniques for the anti-aging, for the lasers and injectables. So, I would, would like to question, it, is there any specific sequence and combination if you want to give, uh, want to give the anti-aging uh, device treatment and injectable? What will be the preference? I'm so sorry, the connection wasn't good. Can you repeat the question? I apologize. Yeah, yeah. The one question, so many techniques, uh, technologies, uh, devices, and injectable available. So, is there any specific sequence and combination you can suggest in our type of skin? Oh, absolutely. So, that's also a whole other lecture I give. I could come back every week and speak if you guys want. Um, I, I think the true artistry in what we do is using things in combination. That truly is the most artistic, but you have to use them in the correct order. So if, for example, I'm doing on the same day a fat grafting and a chemical peel and a laser resurfacing, what I will always do first, I will do the volumization first. And I can do that with synthetic fillers also before I do my resurfacing. And I tell patients, for example, I want to refill their face first so that when I resurface, I can really laser or peel the entire skin and not have to deal with the lines that are going under the skin. So I like to plump everything up first and then come back in and resurface. So I always do my volume before I do the lasers or the peels. But all of these patients, I'm always putting them on a good skincare regimen to begin with, because no matter how much we relax them or refill them or laser them, if their skin doesn't look great while they're going along, nobody else is really gonna see it. But when you have beautiful glowing skin, you're gonna look great before you even have time to do the fillers and the neuromodulators and the surgeries. Excellent, excellent. I have read all your 12 publications and majority publications on the fat transfer. Yeah, I have read all 12 publications. Or laser them. If their skin doesn't look great while they're going along, nobody else is really going to see it. But when you have beautiful, glowing skin, you're going to look great before you even have time to do the fillers and the neuromodulators and the surgeries. All right, Susan, thank you so very much. I have just one quick question before we, before. All right, what I, what I, I don't know, there's some feedback going on in here, but anyway, uh, I wanted to kind of thank Susan for taking the time out and speaking to us. I wanted to thank all the participants Please join the Thomas Academy because we encourage all sub subspecialties to join. So very much. I have one quick question before we. Before. 
All right, then uh, essentially uh, what, I, what I'm finding is, like you rightfully said, feedback going on in here. But anyway, uh, I wanted to kind of thank Suzanne for taking the time out and speaking to us. I wanted to thank all the participants. Please join the Commerce Academy because we are getting all sorts of questions. said, because there's a poor choice of the G3 or other the G prime being used in the nasal jugal area, I find a lot of people coming with complaints, a lot of swelling. And I think what you, what you hit on some very key points, and that is selecting the right uh, G prime products, placing up in the right position, and keeping in mind that sometimes they need to be diluted because otherwise they will be lumpy bumpy. And uh, what I would like to say is that we had people coming and watching you from all parts of the world. I'll be writing to you soon. Susan, you are going to be running for president. I don't know what next. <laughs> you know, people are just loving your talk. So I'll probably invite you back again to speak to us again. Once again, thank you all of you. I wanted to also announce that next week, Dr. Marco Pelosi, the three, the third, is going to be speaking on cosmetic gynecology. Thanks, everyone. Have a very good evening. And a very special thanks to Suzanne. Bye-bye. And Dr. Sakia, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, your next president, you did a fantastic job. Goodbye. Have a good evening. Have a great weekend. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.